Okay, well, um, uh, this is Dr. Morton, and I am doing the video lecture for the uh, 3rd of November, Election Day. And I'm not going to pay any attention to the news until it's all over, probably Wednesday morning, see what happens. Um, anyway, hopefully uh, everybody votes. Hopefully, uh, hopefully your candidate will prevail. Um, all right. Okay, so uh, let's first look at the syllabus so we can see kind of where we are. So believe it or not, the 3rd of November. It's shocking. It really is. So here we're supposed to talk about the uh, serial protocol. Now, we've already been working with I squared C, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to actually break the protocol down a little bit and I'm going to use a logic analyzer and capture the protocol being sent and let you actually look at it and see what it looks like when you decode it. Because uh, it's yeah, it's kind of surprising a little bit. Um, and so we'll do that demonstration, uh, which took me forever to get set up. And uh, then um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about UART, uh, I squared C, and SPI, the, the three serial protocols that you ought to be somewhat familiar with because they're so widely and extensively used. So, so, okay. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, and let's see, what else should I mention? So you should be, you should be working on your projects. Uh, the labs are basically done. Um, uh, so you don't have, once you get, uh, so all the, all, the, all the labs we're gonna do are done. We've done nine labs. And that's all we're going to do. Uh, we're not going to do the lab nine. You, you basically have a built-in um, BJT switch on your Viva board. And uh, we used to pass out uh, little transistors and have people set them up and, and kind of play with them. It, it's really a good thing to do, but I, um, yeah, but I think, I, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to, uh, we're not going to make you do that because I want you to have plenty of time to work on the project. So basically you have from now until, I don't know, whenever the last class day is to submit your project. And then uh, we're probably gonna have, uh, we'll, I'll make the uh, final available somewhere in that week. It's not, you don't have to do it when it's scheduled. And that, in fact, I'll, I'll probably make it available, um, I don't know, Maybe sometime in the last week of class. I, I don't know. Let me look at the, let me look at the last class schedule. Let me look at the schedule here. So, okay. So we have class on the first, and that's the last day. So for sure, um, yeah, for sure you need to. And I guess that is the last day. Um, so I guess we need to. Um, yeah, we'll do we'll do labs. So I'll, what I'll probably do is move these labs up. Yeah, I'm not going to talk much about the Freedom Board. I probably mentioned a little bit, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. We're not going to do the Freedom Board Labs uh, because it's just logistically too difficult uh, to do that. I mean, uh, if you want to buy a Freedom Board and do the labs, you're welcome to. Uh, but you have to download Code Warrior, so it's a whole new IDE. You have to the Freedom Board's like 17 bucks. Uh, I think I was uh, that's what I was paying for them, but we were selling them. Uh, at a loss for about 14 or 15 or something there may be there probably are a few more in the parts bin so if you really want to go buy one you can that's fine uh, and you can play with it but um, anyway we're not gonna we're not I'm not gonna make that a requirement of the course uh, just because there's so many people that are floating all over the place and not that many people are coming to lab so it's it, it's just going to be logistically too difficult to get it done. Uh, they were pretty much just demonstration labs anyway. All you did was copy the code and paste it in. But it's, it's kind of cool. Anyway, so that's where we are. So basically, we're done with labs. It's just the project. So make sure you're working on the project. Uh, if you don't get the project done, you're not getting the grade in the course. And you'll have a year to do your incomplete. Uh, I have students now that are trying to finish up the whole freaking course in the next few weeks. I don't think they're going to be able to do it. They're going to wind up probably with an F in the course. Uh, you get a you get a year uh, and then you're done. 
And um, so, amazing. Okay, well, anyway, enough of my ranting. But I really do want you to put the time in on the project. I will help you. I'm going to, I I guess I totally forgot to do my Zoom session today. Uh, I just realized it this afternoon. Uh, partly because there's just so much I'm 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 super busy trying to get you know trying to stay up with the workload uh, because it's uh, there's a lot and uh, you know it's like 10 lectures a week I'm recording I'm trying to to fine-tune the labs uh, I'm, I'm having to write these online tests they take a long time to get done um, it's just a lot and I, I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up uh, all right. So anyway, um, all right. So as I look at the schedule, uh, we're going to have a fair amount of time, really, to cover a bunch of other stuff. So I'm just going to go over this pro- the serial protocols today, and uh, and that's and then on Thursday, I may talk a little bit about the KL25C, um, and uh, I don't know. I'll probably cover some other stuff, but, I'm, but it won't be a big deal. All right. That having been said. Uh, let me let me get rid of this, and we will uh, do the serial protocols. What I'm going to try and do is see if I can slide this over here a little bit. Oops, wasn't the one I wanted. Let me try one more time. All right, and maybe I can even make this better like that and scoot it over further. Okay, there we go. That's not bad. All right, so there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the CAN bus. Uh, I've never actually used it. It's not available on our board. It's it's a it's one of the automotive buses. Uh, I don't know. There are other automotive buses, and I'm not even sure uh, who uses what. Uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a little bit of a specialty part of my, the microprocessor world. But uh, there are a lot of microprocessors used in automobiles, and interestingly, they all talk to each other through. If they're using the CAN bus, the CAN bus, if they're using one of the other buses through that. So it's kind of interesting that they all talk to each other. All right. So anyway, that's good. So let's jump in. Um, and let's see, I didn't, I guess I haven't given a, a specific due date for the projects. Um, I'll, I'll probably let you go all the way to the 1st of December. But you, you have to have it done on the last class day, the 1st of December. And by that, by done, I mean you have to send me a video uh, or you have to demonstrate it uh, to uh, to the TA in the laboratory, which is fine, or me. I, I'll probably be there too. And uh, so, and I'm, I'm going through the, uh, uh, going through the, uh, the, the proposals and uh, hopefully I'll get those all done this week sometime. Okay, so so we have uh, UART, uh, our serial communication interface, sometimes called. Uh, the, you, the, the, we used to have all these standards, uh, RS-232, RS-422, RS-485, um, and all these had slightly different transmission protocols, but they're all basically the same. They're, they're basically protocols for voltage levels and a few other things, speeds and stuff like that. Um, but, but pretty much the data that was going over them was still the UART type data. And uh, nowadays we have uh, USB. And even the USB, we still send the UART type data over the USB, but the USB is another protocol unto itself. And, and now we're up to, um, now we're up to USB, uh, 3.0. Um, no, I'm sorry. We're up to USB-C, and USB-C is a very, very complicated protocol. Um, it's it's pretty amazing, and the dimensions of USB-C are quite extensive. I probably should uh, I probably should talk about that. Uh, there there are definitely some interesting features. I took a course on it uh, two years ago, and it was super interesting. Or maybe it was last year actually. Yeah, maybe in last year. So anyway, uh, it's it's a, a very impressive protocol. For one thing, you can get I believe the you can get up to uh, I think 24, 25 volts at believe it or not five amps. 
So it, it can supply five amps of current, uh, and that's crazy. Um, whereas the standard, uh, the standard USB, uh, if once you've once it's recognized your device, now it has to officially recognize your device. But if it's but if your device is officially recognized, then you can then you can uh, you can request up to 500 uh, milliamps, so half an amp, so 10 times the current. Um, no, five times the current, right? No. So uh, 500 milliamps versus five amps. No, it's 10 times the current, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 0.5 versus five, right? Okay, sorry. Anyway, and and the voltage is much higher uh, with the standard uh, USB. The voltage is maxed out at five volts, but with the uh, USB-C, you can power your laptop, so it can go up to 24 volts and again, five amps. Uh, and this protocol is bi-directional. Believe it or not, um, if you have a charging pack and you plug it into your laptop, uh, it, it, it then negotiates with your laptop for how it's gonna do the interface. And uh, it 87% of the time, it's gonna set it up so the power pack is powering the laptop. But apparently, 13% of the time, it may uh, it may resolve that the laptop is charging the power pack. <laughs> so it's crazy, and uh, and yet you can have a headset that has USB-C. Now at this point, there is a lot of stuff that claims to be USB-C if you buy it from a disreputable source. It, it may not it may not comply with the with the standard. But if it's officially certified USB-C and it complies with the standard, then then uh, then that uh, then it then it will do these things. And <clears throat> the USB-C plug can be plugged in uh, either way, right side up or upside down. But believe it or not, uh, it it's not it it isn't that no matter which way you plug it in, the wires connect the same. It's not the case. Uh, the wires connect totally differently, and the uh, the the standard uh, negotiates and sorts itself out and decides how the wires are going to be used so that it works out that it can be plugged in either way. Again, just crazy. Um, and apparently, if you want to develop a USB uh, uh, product that gets a USB certification when you send it in to get it certified, uh, and you haven't paid the $500,000 to get the official fa fancy test station, you'll never pass because it's it's that complicated. So so some USB cables actually have active chips in their plugins. Uh, and when you plug in an USB-C cable, it, it goes through a whole bunch of complicated handshaking. There, there are maybe 30, 25, 30, 40 messages sent before it's all sorted out exactly how it's gonna connect. Now, obviously with some devices, much less, but with, uh, but with fancy devices that can operate at different voltage levels and power and can source and can sink and source power can can you you know can deliver power but can also utilize the power like a like a charging pack for instance there it's very complicated uh, and some of the ports have uh, have really good uh, their coaxial cables um, so uh, some some of the wires are just standard wires it's very interesting it's very complicated so so when you uh, when you buy a USB-C cable, uh, uh, you, you you know you, you may if you really want it to be what it's supposed to be, you better buy it from a very reputable source. At this at least at this point. Okay, so so let's talk a little about the, well. So we'll also talk about the ser the serial um, uh, peripheral interface, and that that SPI can refer to several other things. It can refer to, well, so SPI, so there, so SPI is one of the other protocols, and then uh, I2C is another protocol. And again, then there's a whole bunch of other ones, two wire, micro wire, one wire, there's a, there's just a bunch of them. Uh, and then there's a, uh, there's something very similar to the I2C interface that's used uh, when you have a desktop computer or a laptop and you and you 
and you punch the button to turn it on, it uses a variant of I2C to do that. Um, and I forget what that is. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I'll stop that and tell you. Yeah, so it's a uh, it's called SM bus, um, and the SM bus is a system management bus is what it stands for, and it's it's what it's what basically turns on your desktop or your laptop. Uh, it's a it's a special bus that's kind of used more for power management and that kind of thing, uh, not really sending data per se. Um, and it's considered a subset of I2C. Okay, so let's dig in. So the UART. So this, so the UART can run in synchronous and asynchronous modes. The synchronous mode requires, uh, th this is kind of only for very dumb devices. Typically, the UART uh, is used in asynchronous mode. But when you use it in synchronous mode, then, uh, then you basically have a clock only at one end. Whereas in asynchronous mode, you you have a clock at both ends, uh, and in the synchronous mode, you have to send both the data and a clock. Whereas in asynchronous mode, you just send the data. In synchronous mode, the data is transmitted at a fixed rate, but in asynchronous mode, the data doesn't that it doesn't have to be transmitted at a fixed rate. You can actually have it change. And uh, synchronous data is usually transmitted in blocks, while asynchronous data is just trans transmitted one byte at a time. Uh, you can get higher rates in the synchronous mode uh, uh, if, yeah, but there, that requires certain considerations. Uh, I've never used the UART in synchronous mode. It's kind of a rare thing, and most devices are not set up to do that. Uh, but your PIC chip can, can run in, a, in synchronous mode. So I guess you could set up two pink chips and have them talk to each other in synchronous mode if you wanted. In asynchronous mode, the sending and receiving processes operate independently. So your, your pick chip can send data to your desktop whenever it wants. And in theory, your desktop can send data to your pick whenever it wants. Now, the pick has to be, uh, the pick will receive the data automatically, one byte. And it'll put that byte in its receive buffer. And then if you get one more byte, I think it'll hold it in. Uh, there may be a two buffer system there. I can't remember. Um, but when you get that third byte, you overwrite the other bytes, and you get a and you get a and you get an error. Uh, so you your your pick chip has to be set up to handle receiving data and re moving it out of the buffer and either doing something with it or, or putting it in some other memory location to save and process later. You can do this with an interrupt routine because it does have interrupt capability. It will interrupt you whenever it receives a character and then you can go take that character and move it out of the buffer, put it, store it in memory someplace, save the pointer and then keep doing it every time you get a character and eventually maybe you'd fill up memory but I mean you could but you could definitely save a lot of characters. Uh, and then you could go back and process them when you wanted to. Uh, so you could do that with an interrupt, or you could you could uh, poll. You could check the uh, receive flag every now and then, and uh, make sure you checked it often enough that if you got two characters in very quickly, that you wouldn't overwrite one with say the second or the third. I forget whether it's got double buffered or just single buffered. In any event, uh, so for most things, if you're really expecting fully asynchronous receive. You probably do need to set it up with an interrupt. That that's probably the smart way to do it. All right. So a byte of data looks like this. You have you have a start signal, which can be one or two bits, or one bit, and then you have a stop signal, which is usually two bits. And then you specify, and then you have the data, and there's eight bits of data. And then if you want to send another byte, then you can send it. Now one of the uh, so um, yeah, there there have been other and and there is a protocol for sending nine bit data, for some reason. But anyway, most most of the time we do eight bits. And uh, and the this the pick can do nine bit data. I think somewhere it's got a it's got a setting for nine bit data. Yeah, transmit nine. 
well this is the transmit block uh, so it can do tran it can do nine bits if you want uh, but again I've only used it in eight bit mode and this is the ninth bit there which you have to turn on and then the receive same thing and it's got a nine bit mode here and there's the ninth bit but normally almost I've only used it in eight bit mode both both you have a uh, you have a baud rate generator in the pick chip and when you're in asynchronous mode you're always generating the clock at both ends you don't send the clock you're generating at both ends and the and the module is smart enough to uh, to recognize using the start bit when to kind of synchronize the frame so all the bits are lined up appropriately uh, and then and then of course on the stop bit then it's done we we do have this shift register and as soon as it's completed it transfers to the to the RCREG yeah and it's it's only single buffered so now while the next bit bytes coming in it won't overwrite this byte until it's until it's fully received that second byte and then it will overwrite it will transfer the new byte to the receive register and it'll generate a, uh, a frame error okay well maybe actually the frame error may not it, it, it it's a different error um, yeah I think uh, overrun error or something like that anyway it, that it, it will generate an error okay so uh, so the enhanced UART uh, which is what the our chip has it's a pretty fancy UART it does full duplex asynchronous transmit and receive so you can send and receive characters simultaneously you just have to make sure your software is willing is able to handle that okay so it does have a two character input buffer and I, I'm gonna look at the data sheet just so I I didn't see that on the block diagram so it l looks like they count this as one buffer and this is the other whereas I believe in the transmit yeah I don't know yeah I don't I yeah anyway I, I'll let me check the data sheet for that all right well anyhow uh, one character output buffer it's a programmable eight or nine bit character length so you can do nine bit mode you can do uh, you can do nine bit uh, address detection you do you can do input buffer overrun error detection so that's what happens when you overwrite uh, a byte of data with a new byte because the first byte was not serviced by the software receive character framing error so basically it uses the start bit to sort of synchronize and once it gets that uh, then it then it knows where where each of the bits are supposed to be but sometimes if it if the baud generator is off a little bit it'll it'll it won't get things lined up correctly and it'll it'll get uh, uh, framing errors and then uh, you can do half duplex and uh, as a master in synchronous mode or half duplex as a, as a slave in synchronous mode by full duplex and half duplex full duplex means you can go both directions simultaneously half duplex means you can only go one direction at a time and then um, it has uh, programmable clock polarity and synchronous modes again I haven't used synchronous modes and then uh, you can the UART will work in sleep but in sleep it'll only work in synchronous mode and if you remember uh, our sleep lab we did use the UART to wake up uh, the pick but we had to use a jumper from the receive line uh, into another pin and we could use any of a number several different pins but we picked RB5 and then we set that up to be uh, a uh, a uh, interrupt on change pin and so when it detected an edge it triggered an interrupt uh, or at least set the interrupt flag which woke it up from sleep and uh, because we didn't have the global interrupt enable bit on for that part of the lab so in any in any event uh, we we do have the ability uh, to work around the fact that in in asynchronous mode 
that uh, it goes asleep. But we can, like I said, we can use the receive line, put it into a different pin, uh, which of course takes an extra pin, but that's fine. And then, uh, and then use that to uh, to trigger an interrupt, so we can uh, or to tr to wake up from sleep. Basically, you could also do an interrupt, but we we didn't use the full interrupt. We only used the flag to wake us up from sleep. If you remember the the uh, the, the distinction in in our sleep lab, if you don't have the global interrupt bit set, setting an interrupt flag will still wake you up from sleep, but it won't jump into the ISR. It'll just continue execution where you left off, when you went to sleep. Uh, all right, and then, um, so you do have the ability to do what's called automatic detection uh, of the baud rate. So you can receive a signal from, a, from another computer and you're and the pick can figure out what what baud rate that's sent at, and it can set the correct baud rate. Uh, you can also have it set up for this wake up on break reception, but I I don't know, uh, and this 13 bit break character transmit. But again, uh, I think that's only true in simplex mode because I looked at this real, real carefully for the sleep study. Uh, so. Full du duplex mode works great when you're running a terminal program on your desktop or laptop, wanting to talk to another uh, PC, uh, or if you're interacting with other microcontrollers. Anything that has their own clock, you should do full duplex asynchronous mode. But there are some chips that don't have a baud rate generator built into them, and they have to run in simplex. And again, if you're running in simplex, then you actually will can, can continue to run in sleep and, and you can uh, use the break character to wake you up from sleep. So that's kind of cool automatically without having to jump a wire or anything like that. But if you're running in asynchronous mode, then, then, then it, it's not supported and you have to use the workaround. Okay, so um, again, we sometimes call this uh, SCI. Um, which is confusing. But uh, we also have SPI, uh, and that's uh, actually, that screwed me up. I think if, if we go back here, you see we we're going to talk about SPI, but not SCI. So the UART sometimes can stand for serial communication interface, whereas serial peripheral interface is the SPI. Totally different protocols. All right, anyway. So the... Uh, so the universal asynchronous uh, UART basically takes bytes of data and transmits the individual bits in a sequential fashion. And uh, at the destination, a second UART reassembles the bits into complete bytes. And you generally transmit eight bits and not just uh, one or anything. It, again, there is such a thing as a nine bit mode, but I don't think it's used very much. Each UART contains a shift register. The information gets shifted in in the receive side and it gets shifted out on the transmit side. And that shift register is basically how we go from our serial data to, an, to a byte. And once we get the byte, now we're going to move the byte in in parallel. And we're going to process it in parallel. There are a whole bunch of, of voltage and frequency standards out there. Uh, I know RS-232 uses uh, roughly it uses plus 15 and minus 15 to indicate zeros and ones um, whereas uh, on our chip the UART uses uh, zero volts and you know VSS for, z for the zero and VDD for the ones so uh, so if you want to actually send the UART signal out over this old RS-232 standard, you have to get uh, you have to get a device that actually has built-in charge pump and it can pump it up to maybe plus nine and minus nine volts and uh, and then you can actually uh, use the RS-232 protocol. But for the most part, um, we're just going to use a we're going to use USB because uh, very few laptops now are made with RS-232. Uh, desktops usually have one you could hook up if you wanted to, uh, but they don't get a lot of use these days. And some of these other protocols uh, were used, like the 45, I think, was used more 
uh, for connecting some some bench equipment together and some things like that. Most of them have just gone uh, gone by the wayside. We can also uh, drive a Bluetooth dongle with our UART, and uh, we can send the Bluetooth uh, what we call TT level UART. When we say TT level, that's just TTL stands for transistor transistor logic. That's the old logic family that ran on five volts. So basically, what we're saying is five volt logic. But it could also nowadays that can also mean 3.3 volts too. Uh, so anyway, our Bluetooth dongle can take our our TTL signal, 3.3 or five volts, and turn it into a Bluetooth signal. And then any any laptop or desktop with a Bluetooth receiver can receive it that way, which is really a nice way to go too. So and and you can you can get a dongle just like the the cp2102 dongle they make the bluetooth dongles that can plug in exactly the same only there's no cable okay um so the rs232 spec um it was introduced in 1962 it's still in common use but not not for anything new everything new is being run on on uh usb but you'll still find uh, probably merchants with an old cash register uh, that's really a computer, that's really a desktop computer, and maybe the, the cash drawer and uh, the keyboard are using uh, RS-232 plugins. Um, the standard uh, spec did point, plus 3 volts to plus 12, but mostly, most of the time you have to get up to plus nine for it to be recognized by, to, by most uh, uh, RS-232 receivers, and minus nine as well. Uh, usually, uh, if you want to if you, if you wanna take your, you, your TTL level UART and change it to RS-232, you just can buy a, a separate chip, and you attach about five capacitors to it to, to support the charge pump, and boom, it'll translate your signals just fine. Um, and uh, but the easiest thing is to get something like uh, our our our, our uh, CP twenty one hundred two dongle, and just plug that in. You can also get a PL twenty three hundred three. There's a whole bunch of chips that were made. Uh, all right, now the original RS two thirty two actually had a twenty four pin connector, and there were lots of lines and lots of terms. Uh, you could have all these lines hooked up, but most of it was not needed. But uh, some of the some of the uh, some of these are still utilized. Uh, of course, obviously we used we used uh, um, the receive data and the transmit data lines. Um, and this DCE and DTE standard for uh, data terminal equipment and data communications equipment is very confusing. Uh, unless you worked with it all the time. And there would be a carrier detected, uh, data communications equipment modem, data set ready, data signal, data rate selector, uh, data terminal equipment, blah, blah, blah. A lot of lot of signals in here, which rarely were used. Uh, and even in the, the last, say, 20 years of, uh, of RS-232's life, uh, there's almost none of these signals are utilized. So, but remember, RS-232 is a, is, is a, it's a transmission protocol, but the, but the actual information is, is based on a UART. Okay, and here's what an RS-232 port looked like. It was uh, a nine pin connector, five on the top, four on the bottom. And uh, there were also a standard 25 pair plug, which was a DB25, this is a DB9. This, this became much more common. The DB25s were really unwieldy. But when I first started messing with RS-232, you had to have a DB25 cable. And um, the, uh, you also had to kind of know whether you were the DTE or the DCE uh, because that made a difference. But now we don't, you know, that's completely ignored. Uh, and most of the original use was all telecom equipment. And in the old days, they were largely synchronous uh, connections, but now every, you know, almost everything's asynchronous. Again, in the asynchronous mode, 
you, you generate clocks at both ends of the line. Whereas in synchronous mode, you only, only one of the devices generates clock and the other one needs the clock and the data both. All right, so um, the one advantage of the US RS-232 was that you could go over a fairly long distance because it used these higher voltages, plus or minus 15 volts. Um, today, it's really nice because uh, all, you need, uh, all you need is, uh, if, you're, if you're only going to transmit, you just need a common ground and one pin from your UART on your chip. Your transmit pin must connect to receive pin on the desktop. And that's all you have to do. And you don't even have to implement the other side of it. Um, there's, there's no handshaking. So that's really great. So you, you're, you, don't, you don't get out of sync with this typically. Um, now, pretty much only transmit and receive are used anymore, and ground, obviously. And there are many RS-232 to UART converters, but nowadays, most laptops don't even have an RS-232 port. Uh, so we pretty much, um, we pretty much just use the USB, and we use a TTL, U UART TTL level to USB converter. And RS-232 is gone completely. And that's pretty much where we are. So you don't have to worry about RS-232. I'm not, probably, I won't ask any questions about it. Okay, um, so how do you use the UART? So you can use it to transmit and receive independently, and you can make the multi-use output pins available. Uh, so, you, so if you're gonna use the UART, you, then you have to dedicate uh, a receive pin and a, and a transmit pin. And there's only, there's only a couple of those, so you gotta, you gotta make sure you get that right. Uh, you can switch, uh, your choices are, um, uh, a couple of pins in the RB and then the RC5 and RC4, which is what we're using. Um, let's see, maybe I'll pull up the data sheet and take a quick look at that. Let me grab the data sheet here real quick. Okay, so um, so here's the, uh, here's the data sheet. And if you click on uh, chapter 26, you can see here's the UART. And that's where, of course, I got the block diagrams from. And uh, these are some of the features of it. Uh, so um, I've never used the uh, the uh, the baud rate sensing, the auto baud rate feature, but you can't. It is available on this chip in this module. Uh, but we definitely use the full duplex all the time. You've used it in the labs as well. So there's three registers that you have to set up. The, the transmit status and control register, TXSTA, the receive status and control register, RCSTA, and then the baud rate control register. And then there are some other ones, but uh, uh, so we're normally going to use it in asynchronous mode. And I, I do recommend that you read through this data sheet. It's really pretty good. And uh, anyway, there's a number of number of features but it's uh the uh, the transit the transmission protocol is called this non return to zero format and basically there's there's a uh, there's a mark state uh which represents a one and a space state which represents a zero and the non return to zero means that when you're sending uh, uh a, a byte with two ones in a row it doesn't go back down to zero and then back up to the one. It stays high the whole time for both bits. So that, um, so that can make it a little bit tricky to detect the baud rate. Uh, you, you have to hopefully send, uh, send something that has, uh, has some ones and zeros next to each other uh, to, for the software to get, the, get, get a good feel of what the real baud rate is. Um, so normally... Normally we just specify the baud rate and we don't uh, and we don't you know we don't auto detect it. Uh, normally you specify and most of the time when dealing with micros, if we don't need super fast speed, we'll just do 9600. Uh, but if we need something really fast, 
then we can set it up for uh, 115 200 and I you can probably go even faster than that but uh, but that's I think the fastest baud rate typically supported okay I, th I don't I'm not gonna go through this whole data sheet but you should it, it would be good for you to it, it, it does it's a pretty quick read and uh, we might look at the registers real quick though let me just back into it here so um, there are so there are some there are some other registers in, associated with them uh, uh, there's one when you're a slave operating as a slave you can have it set up to to respond to a range of addresses instead of just a specific address and so uh, this is synchronous serial port uh, control uh, con3 and con2 let's see it, I, I somehow I've got into the I, I'm not in oh Wait, let's see something goofed up yeah okay well this is the art here are the registers okay so there's a there's the APF con register that can change which which pins are which. Uh, there's the baud rate where you can you can set some of these values and you can get a range of baud rates. Uh, there's an interrupt control register uh, which allows you to uh, have uh, uh, you have to turn on the GIE and the PIE PEIE and then in PIE one you have the receive interrupt enable. And in PIR one, you have the received interrupt flag, um, so that's uh, that's in synchronous mode. Uh, if we do um, that's synchronous slave, and then if we do uh, that's synchronous master and synchronous master transmission. Uh, but if we do, uh, we should have registers associated with the. Uh, well, here's the baud rate. So this this shows you you've got several bits you can control the sync bit the baud rate generator high bit the baud the baud rate 16 bit and then the sync bit and the baud rate generator 16 uh, well yeah okay same bit yeah so you you can pick different settings and you can see here for an FOS of four mega megahertz um, this gives you some of the baud rates and you'll notice like for 9600 it's really the actual rate is 9615 so it's it has a 0.16 percent error but uh and the decimal value we put into the spbrg with these settings for sync and brg and brg 16 it would be that uh in this case what would i say uh, 103 but uh but it's not perfect right you're still off by 0.16 percent error but it works great it's never really a problem uh, so there's a lot of tolerance uh, in these things but if you get far far enough off then you can actually get into framing errors and then then you may have some trouble with transmissions here's the 115.2 uh, at 4 megs there's you can't go to 115.2 you'd have to up your clock speed to 8 but at 8 megahertz you can you can do uh, 115.2 although it actual rate is 117.6 with a percent error of 2% so interesting right okay so anyway uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through and here's some other settings you can change the sync and the BRG and the BRG 16 and then now you now now with 8 you can't even do 15 2 uh, but here with with uh, FOS of this value you can actually can do 15 2 um, and you can get it right on so that's actually a funny also this is this would be achieved by an external crystal but it lets you get your percent error down to practically zero for most of these common baud rates. Um, and so here's some other ones. Here's four megahertz and uh, these settings and yeah. Anyway, I'm, there's no reason to go through all these. These are just examples. And then you can actually calculate funny funny ones if you need it to. And here are the calculations. All right. Uh, and here's your baud rate control register and there these are some of the bits in there i okay i'm this is this is probably not not something we need to do i'm gonna get rid of this and get rid of this okay so 
Um, okay, so you do have to set up the baud rate generator and you have to think about if you change your system clock, uh, then your baud rate will, must be adjusted. Um, and let's see, um, and you do have to either use interrupts or you have to monitor the busy flag, otherwise you'll, you'll get into trouble. Uh, if you load if you load data before it's all shipped out, it'll it'll interrupt the, the outgoing byte and and override it. So you have to so you you can you don't want to load new data until the other data has been shifted out. Um, okay, we've only got one on this chip, but there there are uh, there are plenty of chips with multiple UARTs, which can be real handy. The uh, KL25Z actually has uh, three UARTs on it, which is nice. Um, the nice thing about this, this module is very capable and it operates pretty much independently of the, of the CPU. So it can be receiving bytes and sending bytes all while the CPU is doing other stuff. And then when it completes sending a byte and it, and it needs to get another byte to send, then you can, you can, it can interrupt you. Um, or you can every now and then check the busy flag. Um, all right. But the outputs from this UART are TTL level. So they're whatever the voltage you're running your chip at. 3.3 volts, 5 volts, or whatever it is. Um, okay. And what's really nice in C, we have this uh, fprintf that automatically does all the formatting and conversion for our numbers so that we can print them out and print them out in decimal or hex. We can print out letters. We can print uh, associated uh, words. We can suppress leading zeros. There's all sorts of uh, we can put it in scientific notation. There's lots of, uh, of uh, support in the, uh, in the fprintf library uh, routine that's really nice. And so, uh, but it does suck up a fair amount of memory. It probably sucks up uh, 1K of, me of program memory all by itself. Um, now, we, now we have the master synchronous serial port. There are two of those on this chip. We do have two. And uh, they can be configured to be I squared C, or they can figure to be SPI, either one, and so they're 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 very helpful and very nice in that regard. Um, you can operate your chip as a master, and there can even in, when you're using I squared C, there can even be multiple masters. It it it's it's probably not a great idea, but it 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 there it does provide for that. Um, and you can also set your chip up to be a slave. So you could actually have one of your I squared C ports, uh, one of your master synchronous serial ports running I squared C as a master and another one running I squared C as a slave. This is not a bad way to talk between um, integrated circuits uh, uh, and two PIC, two PIC chips could talk to each other using I squared C. They could also talk to each other using UART. Uh, the nice thing about UART is if you only want to transmit, you only need the transmit line. If you only want to receive, you only need to use a receive line. And you can use the other line for other stuff. That pin doesn't have to be dedicated for the UART. Whereas in I squared C, it does take two lines. You can't just use one line. You always have to have both lines. Now, in SPI, you might have to have as many as four lines. And for every additional uh, slave, you might have to add one additional slave select line. Whereas in I squared C, on these two lines, you can hang a, a bunch of slaves if you want. Um, so, all right. The lines, the I squared C lines are all what's called, they're all driven as open collectors. And I think I did explain this, which means you have to have a pull-up resistor on each line. You can't use the internal pull-ups because they're not strong enough. They won't work. Um, and, in our, and in our protocol, we call the uh, clock line SCL. And we call the data line SDA. When we run SPI, we give them different names. Okay. So, um, so we're not going to talk about multi-masters. It's just that it is possible. If you want to do that, you, you're going to have to learn about it yourself because very few people are doing it. It's probably easier just to use a second I squared C unless you just don't have one. Um, or unless you have to talk to the same slaves or something. Normally your addresses are 7 bits, but there is a 10-bit address mode. And uh, we send 8 bits whenever we send, we almost always send a byte. When we send out the byte, 
we add a bit to the seven bit address to make it an eight bit address and that that last bit is the low order bit and that bit is either a zero or a one which determines whether we're telling the slave that we're going to read to it, we're going to read we want to read from it or we're going to write to it once we address it so first we address it and we address it with either the read or write bit set and then depending on that we're either going to get data from the slave or we're going to send data to the slave because there's seven bits of address in theory you could have 128 different addresses but because these addresses are often hardwired into an integrated circuit you 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 wouldn't necessarily be able to get 128 unique addresses and on top of that address 0 is kind of reserved anyway so the most you would have is 127 so uh, and if you put it if you put 128 things on on this on these uh, i squared c lines there'd be so much uh, parasitic inductance and capacitance that uh, you, you wouldn't be able to run it at 400 uh, kilohertz you'd have to run really slow and uh, your pull-up resistors would have to be removed and replaced with different resistors to make it work um, the address zero is supposed to be uh, uh, an address that all slaves are supposed to respond to but don't count on it because most have not implemented it or support it uh, many to i2c devices are hardwired uh, so that your address is fixed now on the uh, on our uh, on our um, here I'll pop this up here. so let me bring this over here okay so here's a here's our uh, our two line by 16 LCD display and it's currently being run uh, it's currently being run by I squared C now this particular chip if you flip it over you'll notice it, that there are three little three little uh, shorting blocks here where you could put solder blobs on them and that's the lower three bits of the address they're normally shipped with pull-ups so that uh, so that the addresses are all high which means uh, it has a seven bit address of 27 hex but if you short some of these out you can make it 26 hex 25 24, 23, 22, 21, or 20. And I have some that actually run at 20. This one uh, has solder blobs on all these little things here. And those solder blobs make the address, sets the address to uh, to 20 instead of 27. And you can do part of them. So you can actually have eight different uh, displays with this PCF chip on there uh, dri driven off the exact same uh, same line which is kind of cool. Um, all right. Now, this setup here, uh, I have my I have my, a little logic analyzer here and I have it plugged into the I squared C lines. So, what we'll do is we'll capture it's printing it's printing out these letters one at a time. Now, because the uh, because we're in 4-bit mode, you, you, we have to send the high byte and the low byte out, and also because only four bits uh, are being used for the for the for the letters, and then some of the other bits are being used for the control lines and the register select line, and also for the uh, the E line, the clock line, and then one of the bits is used to turn on and off the backlight. So, so you won't actually see. You'd have to decode the bits being sent. So when we send a byte, uh, it first it takes two writes. And secondly, uh, uh, so you're not going to really see the raw data going to here. You're going to see it encoded into two separate bytes in the I squared C protocol. Uh, but you can see the slave address being sent out because that's sent out as one byte because the slave address is is not to the two line by 16 LC display. The slave address is to this PCF chip on the daughter board. And, and that chip has an address of 27. So we can see the 27, but the the rest of the data is, becomes really difficult to see. Uh, but we're going to capture it. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm probably going to reset this. Uh, shoot, didn't. Uh, okay, now it's going to start writing these out again. 
Okay, so A, B. Okay, so let me bring up my um, my data capture software here, which is right here. And, um, and then I'll put this down below maybe, or maybe I'll pull this down. Now, what, what I want to do, I want to punch this. I want to capture it, and I'll get one little burst of data like this. So I'm going to have to slide this over. And so, so what I'm going to do is I'm one two, three, uh, we've got a problem. What happened? Oh, we got in wrong thing. Okay, capture mode. Okay. Okay, so here, here it is. So next time, oh crap, okay. Okay, I'm gonna reset it. Okay, now. Okay, so I'm going to one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so I did catch it. So it samples for about two seconds. I think that's what I have it set for. Okay, now, now we can see where that is. Uh, so here it is right here. Now, you can't tell anything from this, but we can, uh, we can uh, zoom in. And here is... Here is, and I don't know, maybe we can even make this bigger. Can we do that? Oh, yeah, we can. Look at that. That's really cool. All right, so now we've got our whole sequence. We didn't even have to go that big. Let me just whoosh. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we can cheat a little bit here. Okay, so here is our sequence. Now, now if I if I zoom in here a little bit, uh, yeah. So you can see this says setup right to, and notice it's got the address zero x twenty seven plus ac. Now here's the way this looks. So this is this is the clock up here. Uh, this is the SCL track, and this is the SDA track. So the clock is tick, 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 ticking, tick, 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 and then the last one is the ag. Now, what happens is, uh, we're we're sending out, so we're sending out data on each of these six. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then the ninth one, we receive a a reply from our slave, an acknowledge. Okay. And um, I don't know if it's going to tell us about the ACK. Yeah, it it's, tells us about the ACK there. All right, so here's our start bit right there. This is the start. And then the, uh, the first rising edge latches in a 0. The next rising edge latches in a 1. The next one is 0. So if I wrote those down... Um, Let's do that. I'm going to write that down. So it's so it's going to be zero, one, zero. So zero, one, zero, zero. And one, one, one. All right. And then, uh, and then the last one is a zero which is a right. Uh, and then this is the acknowledge. And the acknowledge is also a zero. Uh, so I guess that's good. Okay, so so if you look at that then, uh, if I look at that that I just wrote, so zero, zero, one zero zero one 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 and then the last one is a zero so uh that's the right bit that's seven and that's uh well it looks like four to, oh that, no that yeah so it, it divides like this remember it's seven bits so now this is the address so seven bits one two three four one two three 
So here are your first three bits, 0, 1, 0, because it's only a 7-bit address, 0, 1, 1, 1. So that's 2, 7. And then we add the right bit. So once we do that, what we really have then is uh, it's, it's going to be 4, uh, 4 E. So, that, so when we shift it by, this, by adding that 0, we wind up with 4 E hex. And, and believe it or not, this, this, can be part of, this can be just terribly confusing. Um, but anyway, it's what it is. Okay, so then the next bit here uh, is 6D and then 69. Okay, so that's, that's what we have to do. We have to, so we have, it takes four bytes to send one byte to the display. One, two, three, four. And that's because we have to lower the e, the e, raise the E, and then we lower the E, raise the E. And so, so in, in so doing, we, uh, we effectively cause the PCF uh, chip on the, on the daughter board to send the right information to the 2x16 two, two display. But it takes four bytes to send one 8-bit data byte. And of course, part of this we have to have the RS, the RS line has to be uh, up, and so forth. And I don't even remember what character we were seeing here. And then, um, so that's that's the first write. And then you can see, then we have another start bit here. See the little green thing? It's a restart actually. And then we have we send the address again, and now. Uh, this address is uh, so let's look at it zero one zero zero one 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 zero yeah is that the same yeah I guess it is and uh so it sends out the address again, and it's also going to write again. And now it's going to write. Hmm. So one, two. Yeah, I'm not exactly totally sure what's going on there. Yeah, but it's it's writing again, and it writes this. And then it sets up to read. Well, I don't really know. I'm not sure what that's doing. Um, oh, I know. I know what this is doing. Yeah, so what's going on now is it's going to read the busy bit. But to read the busy bit, this is really confusing. It has to... It has to this PCF chip doesn't really have fully buffered uh, bidirectional port. What it what it actually has it actually has um, it actually has open collectors. So what you can do is you can you can you you can make you can write FF to the eight bits, and then what happens is when you do that, you can then read all eight bits, and uh, and so because because it's open collector then the two line by 16 display can actually drive those those lines uh low if it wants and so then you can actually read so this what this does then it writes it writes this ff to the uh to the pcf chip uh and actually it's only writing it to the uh to the it well yeah it Anyway, it writes that out, and then now it's going to issue. Um, now it's going to issue. It's going to issue a read request, so it sends the address, the slave address again of 27, but it has a one appended. Now, you can see the eighth bit is a one here, so it's going to be zero one zero zero one 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 one. So now it's reading, and here's what it reads, and it reads. Uh, one, two, three. It reads uh, it reads two bytes, because it only uh, yeah it reads two bytes. Which uh, yes, it reads two bytes, 
and I forget why it has to do that. Uh, I just haven't done it in recently enough. Um, and then it sets up to read again, and it reads again, and this time it gets it gets the one of the bytes. It's it's looking for the bit seven of the data line uh, to be uh, high, which means that it's uh, that it's uh, finished uh, executing the initial uh, write. And anyway, it, it gets it here, and so then it quits, and it, it and it issues two stop bits, and it's done. And that's all it sent out for that entire thing. But it's it's there's a lot to the protocol, but it's it's kind of fun to actually see this uh, all kind of laid out here. That's the entire transaction, right there. Start bit, address, for write. Four byte, four bytes, to uh, actually write the letter, and then uh, and then sending out FF so that we can read, and then sending out the read request, and reading once, then reading again, getting what getting what we want, and then we're done. And that's it. So that's what it looks like when you decode the protocol. And of course, when you just, you can see it didn't take long. The whole thing took uh, less than, it took, uh, what, about, about three, one, two, less than two milliseconds. So, yeah. All right. So hopefully that gave, gives you a little bit of idea. Uh, I'm probably going to have to cover the SPI later. So we'll just do that later. We got plenty of time to do it. So we'll, we'll do it. We'll, I'll probably cover the SPI on, on Wednesday then. All right. Sorry, Thursday. Okay. So, all right. So hopefully that gives you some insight into I squared C. Um, it is a little, uh, when you try and when you use a, a, um, a logic analyzer like that, it, it can be uh, it can be kind of uh, uh, off-putting initially. It's it can be a little complicated. Uh, let me actually uh, let me pop that back. What what I was going to show you is uh, so I've selected I squared C, and then it gives me some options here. I could uh, instead of ASCII and hex, I can just look at hex. I can look at ASCII, and and then there's all sorts of other things you can do. Um, and, and then you can look at where it decoded the protocol here. So it, it really wrote it out for me. So basically it says, set up right to 27. It acknowledged it. And then I'm, I send 6D and 69. Now it decodes it. It says that's a lowercase m and an i. But, it, but, but because, remember, it took four full bytes. The, the difference between these two bytes, 6D and 69, uh, is I'm... I'm I'm changing the E line. That's what I'm doing, and and in the process of changing the E line, I am uh, I'm I'm actually uh, locking in the data. So, uh, in order to toggle the E line, I have to send two separate bytes because remember, I'm using I squared C protocol to control the PCF chip that is controlling the LCD display. Okay, so that's why it's that's why it's confusing. If we were if we were writing and reading to say uh, a GPS chip or something like that, it'd be a lot easier to see what we're doing. But uh, but we're 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 having to we're having we're we're going through a PCF chip that's also then driving the LC the two line by sixteen LCD display. Uh, but anyway, and then you set up to write again, and we write this, and then we set we set up to uh, read, and then we read, and then finally we get what we want, and we're good. Yeah, and you can see here we got 46, 46, and here we got 66. And that was what we were looking for, apparently. So once we saw that, we were good. Okay, and yeah, that should do it. Okay, um, 
So we will. Uh, so make sure you're starting to work on your project. If you do not have all your labs done, get all your labs done. Uh, I think all the homeworks. Uh, I'm pretty sure the homeworks finished now. Um, and uh, and make sure you complete all your labs. Make sure you get your pro start working on your project. And then I'm going to review your proposals. Make sure they're they're all copus static. All right. Uh, with that, we'll. Remember, you can always come to lab on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays to get help. Uh, Monday and Wednesday at 2, Tuesday at 11.30. And all you have to do is uh, go on ASAP and look at DS, the DSD course and see when the lab times are. And, that, that, and I'm always there when they start. I'm always there at 2 on Monday and Wednesday and 11.30 on Tuesday. There's no labs on Thursday. And then on Friday, I'm there at 10, usually for an hour or two till noon or so. But the labs open till about three on on Fridays, so come into lab and get help if you need it for, on your projects. <coughs> okay, excuse me, I had to sneeze really bad. All right. <coughs>